Welcome. My name is John Pilcher. I'm a bariatric surgeon in San Antonio. This video is an update for a January 2017 video that I posted comparing the gastric bypass and the sleeve, hopefully to help people choose between these operations. At that time in 2017, these two operations were the most commonly done in the U.S. and worldwide, and that continues to be true. And uh, both of these operations continue to be excellent operations that give most patients substantial weight loss and substantial health improvement. But there has been some newer information that's come out, especially on the sleeve side, that has caused my own practice to shift just a bit towards gastric bypass. That's a spoiler. Stay tuned and I'll talk to you a lot more about it. And before I go into the comparison of these operations, just a couple of uh, background points of information, or you might call them disclaimers. Um, first of all, I think the most important thing is that you're here watching this and you're thinking about bariatric surgery for your weight and your health. I think that, uh, I don't know your circumstances, obviously, but I think that can be a fantastic decision uh, that people um, ought to think about once they've found that diet and exercise alone or with meds are not giving you sustained substantial weight loss. So that's the big decision compliments on researching for you at this time. Second, um, I think for most patients, both of these continue to be very good options. I think that when patients research these, like you're doing right now, I think that patients develop a sense of what is the right fit for them. Call it a vibe or a gravitation towards one of the operations. And when I sit down with patients, I think that's actually a really important factor because this is a procedure or a tool that you're going to put to work inside your body over many years and probably decades. I find it's really important that you feel comfortable with that operation. And also, when you sit down with your surgeon, you should expect to have a collaborative discussion. You're going to bring your opinion, your knowledge, your vibe, your, your request for advice. And what the surgeon is going to bring is, is a more experienced level of knowledge about how your medical factors impact on the choice for surgery. And the surgeon's also going to bring some knowledge in the background about their own operative capabilities and the capabilities of their team and, and where your surgery may take place and where you live and how far it is from their center um, that may have an impact on the choice as well. So be open to all of those discussions and let it be a collaborative decision, but I do really think it's important for you to feel comfortable with the decision in the long run. There are going to be a couple of procedures that I'm not going to discuss. Again, this is going to be a focus of gastric bypass versus gastric sleeve. Um, on the lighter end of things, I am not going to talk about the lap band. Uh, in my opinion, the lap band really should not be done anymore. It was done commonly, very commonly, in the middle 2000s up into the 2011-2012 time frame. Um, I think that it does not last and I think it actually causes more side effects than were realized initially. So we're setting that aside. I'm also not going to talk about the duodenal switch. Um, this is a more intense operation that does lead to more weight loss than either the gastric bypass or the sleeve. Part of how it gets there is that it intentionally reduces the absorption of food and nutrients, maybe some vitamins, and that's what I mean when I say more intense. Um, it is an operation that's done regularly in uh, certain centers across the country, so I would call it a definitely a valid operation. Uh, I'm waiting to see more information about medium and long-term outcomes before I decide exactly where this fits in with my practice. This whole video is going to refer to what I'm going to call a standard Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. And there are some variations out there like the mini gastric bypass or the one anastomosis gastric bypass that sometimes are constructed intentionally to reduce the natural absorption of food and nutrients. That's not the case with the standard gastric bypass. Um, and so we're going to refer to the standard gastric bypass throughout this talk. I like to begin my comparison between these operations by talking about the things that are practically the same between the operations, and this covers a lot of the important territory. First of all, the preparation is the same. Uh, insurance covers both. Uh, the insurance preparation is the same. The dietary teaching is the same and the medical preparation is the same. Both of them are done minimally invasively or laparoscopically. This means that we're using multiple little incisions and the TV cameras, um, and so essentially the same on that. Both of them are fairly quick operations. Now, not that we're in a hurry, we never hurry in surgery, but the sleeve typically takes a bit less than an hour of operating time, and the gastric bypass just a bit more than an hour of operating time. Both of them have pretty much the same recovery, meaning that many patients can go home the same day, 90% um, of patients are home by the next morning and people can be out and do normal activity like driving in two or three days, the same between the operations. And essentially everyone is going to be ready to go back to work at two weeks after the surgery. Although within that two weeks, in both cases, you'll have some significant fatigue or at least fatigue is very common. 
It's the same vitamins for both cases, for both types of operation, and that's going to be vitamins daily for life, very important. And um, the same experience on our side that both of the, of the operations work better with extended long-term follow-up and engagement with our team. Now to set the table to discuss the differences between the gastric bypass and the sleeve, I'm going to review the anatomy for each of them and how it's done and how it works. We're going to begin with the sleeve operation. And so again, this is done minimally invasive with little incisions. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a surgical stapler to cut up along this edge of the stomach and we're going to literally remove 70-80% of the stomach here, take it out of the body. And this is going to work for you in two ways. One thing is that you're going to have a smaller stomach, you won't hold as much food. And then what's also important is that there's a very powerful hormonal effect. Now, to get into that hormonal effect, I'm going to digress just for a second. This is an interlude. And uh, just to remind you, as you've seen in other videos, that we understand that the obesity disease is actually an imbalance in the hormone mechanisms. Your body has a powerful, constantly functioning, unconscious fat control system. And it makes sense that you have a powerful fat control system because a little bit of fat is a survival resource. And so this fat control system is controlling your fat storage at a certain level, just like it controls your blood pressure at a certain level, just like it controls your breathing, it controls your temperature at a certain level. These things happen all the time without you actually thinking about it. And uh, in the U.S. and worldwide, for different reasons for different people, this fat control system gets out of balance and the system uh, starts to try to uh, um, hold on to excess fat. Think of it as like a fat thermostat that is stuck at an abnormally high level and conceptually the term that we use is set point. And so the set point is stuck at an abnormally high level. Why does this interlude matter? Why is it worth talking about? Because the sleeve and the gastric bypass, they do work through restricting the food that you can hold. There's a smaller amount of food, but more importantly, we need to change that set point and work on the hormone levels. And so the cool thing that does not show up on the diagram is that when we remove this part of the stomach with the sleeve, we're taking out some of the hunger hormones. Ghrelin is one of them. It's probably more complicated than that. And when we take out those hunger hormones, we make a situation that the patient doesn't feel like they need as much food. The actual appetite and the hunger level drops down in a way that's sustainable and lasts for many years. So once again, with the sleeve, there's a smaller stomach and it's not so much that a person can't hold as much food, that's true, but more important that they don't want as much food. When the gastric bypass is done, it's also done with little incisions in the TV camera. One important part of the surgery is using our surgical stapler to cut across the upper stomach and to create this very small stomach pouch. And momentarily during surgery, there's nowhere for the food to go, but don't worry, there is a plan. And so the next part of the plan is that we take a section of the small intestine from the middle abdomen where it normally lives, and we bring it up either behind or in front of the colon, behind or in front of the stomach, and we attach it onto this little stomach pouch so that there's a new pathway for the food. So the food's going to come down the esophagus into the little stomach pouch and it's going to go down this intestine and it's going to bypass this section of the stomach and the duodenum. That's important. We'll come back to that in a minute. But it's going to bypass those structures and come on down here. Now, there is a place for digestive juices. The digestive juices are made in this part of the stomach and in the bile duct and also the pancreas, which the artist did not include. But those digestive juices come in here. The digestive juices flow in this part of the intestine. There's a connection here. And so the food's coming this way, and the digestive juices are coming here, so that there's normal absorption downstream. One interesting feature of the gastric bypass, even though it looks a little bit more complicated, is that nothing is removed. All of the parts are still there. It's more of a reorganization of the food flow. Now, I know from looking at this diagram with patients over the years that questions come up about this section of the stomach. It looks like it might be floating or it might uh, twist or fold or something weird might happen to it. But here, the artist has oversimplified a bit, understandably. And what the artist did not include is lots of blood vessels along this edge and blood vessels along this edge. Those blood vessels keep that stomach healthy with oxygen and nutrients. And they also hold that stomach in place so that it does not move around.
And in fact, it's interesting, we mess with those blood vessels very little as we just cut across this upper part of the stomach. The other thing I've learned that patients wonder about is um, this part of the colon is shaded out here. And, and this does not mean that we're doing anything to the colon. It just means that they, oops, they just shaded out the colon so that you could see what's happening with the small intestine because some surgeons bring the intestine up behind the colon and the artist wants you to be able to see that. So again, nothing happening to the colon, no risk factors with the stomach that's been bypassed. So as I said, in this gastric bypass anatomy, there's a tiny little stomach pouch that doesn't hold much food, and that is an important factor in weight loss, but there is also an important hormonal factor. Now in the sleeve, we talked about the hormone benefit from removing the stomach, and I just told you that in the gastric bypass, that stomach is still there, and it's healthy, and it's in the same place. So I want to give you an explanation about what's happening hormonally with the gastric bypass. It's a little bit complicated, but stick with me. So the story begins with actually normal anatomy, not surgical anatomy. So no gastric bypass, no sleeve. And it turns out that part of how the um, hormone balance gets out of control is because of the food passing through this normal section, the duodenum. And what I'm describing to you is what we call the foregut theory or the upper gut theory of gastric bypass and obesity. So it turns out that this section of the intestine is densely lined with cells that sense food and assess food, and then this section is also networked with the surrounding organs through neurologic connections and hormonal connections. It's networked so that it's supposed to help the body respond in real time in a healthy, appropriate way to the food that you take in. But people that have this obesity disease, when food hits the duodenum, very often it causes the body to overreact or misreact to food. And so people can actually feel a lack of satisfaction or even feel hunger just after they ate. Now, not all of my patients have this experience, but many do. And for many, this is still happening on an unconscious level in the sense that the body sees the food come in. Food may even stimulate more hunger, and that's coming from the passage of food through this section here. So, when we do the gastric bypass, and the food travels this different pathway, straight down here, and it does not go through this section, the duodenum, then the system is uh, kind of taken offline. It's allowed to calm down a little bit, and other backup hunger mechanisms take over that are sort of more accurate or more healthy for the body in the long run. So the gastric bypass, once again, has a powerful impact with the smaller stomach, but an even more powerful direct hormonal impact with reduced hunger so people don't want as much food. For those of you who are watching and are my science and physiology nerds, I feel compelled to let you know that what I'm saying with the ghrelin and hormone removal on the sleeve and with the foregut theory on gastric bypass, um, these are probably just part of the story. And um, they may not even be the full story, and science is going to take many years to develop an accurate picture. Um, but it's fair to say that these are accurate representations of how people feel with a restriction on the amount of food they can eat and a smaller desire for food. Uh, in fact, there are probably many different hormonal underpinnings for this obesity disease. In other words, people probably have the obesity condition for different reasons across the spectrum. Um, and there are definite physiologic changes that go on with both the sleeve and the gastric bypass that I did not mention in those earlier discussions. For example, uh, both operations involve healthy transitions in the colon microbiome. That's the normal bacterial contents of the colon from an unhealthy balance to a healthy balance. Balance. Similarly, both of them involve healthy changes in the bile salt composition. Um, people who suffer from the obesity condition have an unhealthy mix of bile salts that transitions to a more healthy mix in the context of both the sleeve and the gastric bypass. Those things may or may not turn out to be key factors for all patients, maybe some patients. Um, and many of these changes are happening over a matter of millimeters and centimeters within the bloodstream, the bloodstream of the intestine, the portal system, or they may be happening in the nerve system because the whole intestinal system has its own sort of like second brain. Um, and so I think the research to elucidate these mechanisms is going to take many years. There's another important hormonal feature that I haven't mentioned so far. The cool thing is that the hormone changes with both the sleeve and the gastric bypass work mainly on an individual's excess fat storage. And I mentioned that there's a powerful control system for fat storage in the body with the set point that the body will hold on to at a certain level. 
The neat thing is that there is also a nutrition management system which is not changed, it's not disrupted by either the sleeve or the gastric bypass. And so what the operations tend to do on a hormonal level is they tend to change the set point down so that people tend to lose excess body weight and it depends on where they start. A 400 pound person will lose a lot more weight than a 185 pound person. Both of them will lose an amount of weight that's more or less appropriate to their body, although honestly the 185 five pound person will get closer to a, a nice perfectly healthy weight because their obesity disease did not go as far before we got it under treatment. But my point is that neither one of these operations, neither the sleeve nor the gastric bypass, tends to cause excess weight loss. I hope that so far I'm presenting the gastric bypass and the gastric sleeve in a fairly balanced way and I hope I'm going to continue to do that for the rest of the video as we do comparisons. But it's time for an interlude. And the interlude has to do with the fact that so much of the information on the web describes the gastric bypass as being much more invasive or much more intense in comparison to the sleeve. And I would say yes, it's true that the gastric bypass does have some additional technical complexity. There are some finicky parts that can be a little bit more technically challenging. but I'm going to stick with the idea that both of them have almost exactly the same physiologic impact on the patient and almost the same risk factors and very similar outcomes with some key differences that we'll come back to. So anyway, if I say they're almost the same and the web says the gastric bypass is more scary, where is that mismatch coming from? And um, I think at least part of the story is coming from a banned marketing program. And it's going to take a little bit of history. So the lap band came to the U.S. and was approved by the FDA in 2001. At that time, the only bariatric operation or the only competition was the gastric bypass because the sleeve didn't come along until 2005. And so, of course, the band had a manufacturer with it, and the manufacturer had a goal, appropriately, to sell as many bands as they could sell. And so they had a marketing program, which was relatively new to the bariatric surgery arena, this marketing program. And so the marketing program not only presented educational materials showing how good the band was, or how nice it was, or how easy it was, they also... Um, very appropriately or reasonably uh, marketed against the gastric bypass and what they did was they selected certain studies that were real about the gastric bypass from the 80s and 90s showing very difficult outcomes and this was in the time when the gastric bypass was being done with the big open incision uh, when surgeons were still learning how to do the operation well and still learning how to prepare patients and so in the 80s and 90s there were many more complications and risks and and the band marketers presented those older papers as if that was the current gastric bypass information and so they made the gastric bypass look a little worse than it really was even at that time. And so the band, by the way, has gone away because the band turns out not to be a good lasting operation. Uh, but the information that um, was put out there that made the gastric bypass seem more intense or more scary uh, than it is now um, has interestingly kind of hung around. Um, I'm going to present some comparisons to you based on actual data between these operations and we'll see that they're actually uh, fairly balanced. So the information that you get off the internet, um, you know, I'm not against the internet, I think a lot of it is good, but just take it with a grain of salt. Now back to the comparison that I promised between the gastric bypass and the sleeve. And this is where we're starting to see some differences between these operations. I'm going to present these differences as well as I can given the current state of medical and surgical knowledge with the understanding that this knowledge continues to evolve and it's a very active area of research. Even the ideas about the obesity condition continue to change and continue to grow. But there's been more information on the sleeve in particular, not so much the gastric bypass which has been around more or less in its current form since the 80s, but on the sleeve which began in 2005, there are only now developing solid 10-year results and uh, 15 and 20-year results. So putting together the developing sleeve data as well as the developing science about the obesity disease, I'll probably be back with another update in three to five years. And so before we get into the differences, let's just review the similarities between these very briefly. Now just a quick recap on the key similarities between these operations before we go into the differences. Both of them are fairly quick operations with a fairly short hospital stay and a fairly quick return to normal activity. Both of them have the same food plan which is low carb and keeping the chemicals to a minimum so you could call it clean low carb. Both of them have a strong, substantial, positive impact on the weight and weight-related problems, including high blood pressure, breathing issues like sleep apnea and asthma, 
improve joint pain and reduce body inflammation, and really reduce cancer risk for both of these. Both of them involve sustained substantial reductions in hunger through the hormone changes, and uh, for both of them, the amount of weight loss is proportional to where you begin. So bigger people lose more weight, people who start at a lower level lose an appropriate amount of weight without losing too much weight. Up until this point, I've been presenting a pretty balanced perspective between the gastric bypass and the gastric sleeve, and, and that's absolutely correct, but there are some differences, and we're going to begin discussing the differences in terms of some of the key health outcomes. Um, there are differences in three key health outcomes that I want to talk about right now. Number one, weight number two, diabetes, and number three, a substantial difference in the occurrence of reflux after the two operations. First of all, discussing the weight situation. So both operations cause substantial weight loss with the weight settling out at about one year. We like to look at weight maintenance at two years to see kind of what trajectory a patient is on for lifetime because we do want to think about lifetime weight control. And um, at one and two years, there's a slight statistical advantage towards gastric bypass with better weight loss, maybe a 10% difference between the two, and I don't think that amount of difference is a make or break for most patients. However, now that we have 10 year plus results with the sleeve, we're seeing that over time the effect of the sleeve or the impact of the sleeve seems to fade a little bit and there is a bit greater chance of weight regain for sleeve patients over gastric bypass. And there's actually one special different circumstance of female patients who are a little bit older and have some medical conditions. And in this subset of patients, we're talking about people who don't have a lot of muscle mass. Every once in a while, hormonally, the sleeve kind of misses the target. And what this does in terms of weight is that this small subset of patients, and it runs three to five percent of the female patients, never happens to a guy. Go figure. Irritating, right? Um, anyway, in this small subset of female patients, uh, the, pra the patient can do everything correctly with their sleeve operation, but they lose only 30 or 40 pounds. And for most patients, that's really not very satisfactory to go through surgery, recovery, expense, risk, and all that stuff. So. Um, Science is not letting us be smart enough yet to know exactly which patients would be affected by this because obviously we would incorporate that, that into our decision process, um, but I just want to let people know about those statistics. Thinking about the diabetes and the health differences, they pretty much track with the amount of weight loss and the amount of weight maintenance. So both of the operations are excellent with pushing diabetes into remission at year one and year two. Uh, both of them tend to have a slight chance of weight regain over time. Again, less chance of weight regain if you stay with us and stay engaged. But both operations have a slight chance of weight regain, the sleeve a bit more chance of weight regain than the gastric bypass, so the sleeve a bit more chance of diabetes reoccurrence. Now reflux is the third factor that I mentioned. There's a pretty big difference on this. So for patients who go into surgery with reflux, the gastric bypass will reliably make that much better and mostly put it into complete remission for the rest of their life. Not 100%, but very high percentage. The sleeve will usually make the reflux worse for people. For people who start off without reflux, the gastric bypass rarely creates reflux. It does happen, although it's very uncommon, less than 5%. And the sleeve creates reflux in 30 to 40 percent of patients, and so it's a pretty big deal. In fact, a study came out in July of 2020 which showed us that a surprising, still a small percentage, like 8 to 10 percent, but a surprising percentage of patients were having enough uh, trauma or irritation on their esophagus from the reflux and heartburn that they were having an injury condition or a cellular change condition in their esophagus called Barrett's esophagus. The extent, or I won't go into great detail about Barrett's esophagus here, but suffice it to say that the recommendation has come forward from our national society that all sleeve patients should have an uh, endoscopy, an upper scope done every five years to make sure that injury is not happening and to monitor for that because that gets into a different medical care track. And for me, um, the reflux situation and the need for endoscopy, that's not a showstopper for sleeve, but it's the newer information that has moved me back a little towards gastric bypass because the gastric bypass looks like actually the lower maintenance operation over time. Um, you know, and I want that to be something that patients are aware of in their decision process. Separately, there are several other factors that are not exactly health outcomes, but they're factors that ought to be taken into account with the patient and the surgeon as we try to decide which is the best fit. Those features are number one, tobacco use. Number two, the use of aspirin or related medicines that are called non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. I'm going to abbreviate that as NSAID, so aspirin related NSAIDs. And number three, dumping syndrome. 
Let's break these down. So when we talk about tobacco, of course, it's going to be important to stop smoking or using any tobacco for at least the month leading into the surgery because tobacco use not only interferes with lung function, but it leads to a much greater chance of leak for either the sleeve or the gastric bypass. So leading into surgery, it's really important to avoid nicotine and tobacco products completely. After the surgery, I hope you don't go back to smoking. Uh, obviously, tobacco has a lot of negative impacts on your body overall. However, if you do resume smoking at some point one year or five years later, the sleeve is not going to be really adversely impacted, but the gastric bypass will be strongly adversely impacted by smoking because smoking in gastric bypass patients is very likely to cause ulcers. Ulcers can lead to pain, difficulty eating, bleeding, or even perforation. So it's a really big problem. And if there's any question about smoking or using tobacco products in the future, that would be a factor in favor of choosing the sleeve operation. Second factor, the aspirin family or NSAIDs. These medicines are a different factor that can cause ulcers after gastric bypass. Here again, we want to avoid these medicines leading into surgery because they also cause a little bit of free bleeding. They interfere with platelet function. But after the surgery and after people heal for the sleeve, the sleeve is relatively tolerant of these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, whereas the gastric bypass is very sensitive. So for a gastric bypass, even one day of taking a few three doses of ibuprofen Ibuprofen can cause an ulcer with pain, bleeding, perforation, etc. Now, this is a tricky conversation because many patients coming into bariatric surgery have back pain, knee pain, body aches, fibromyalgia, autoimmune diseases, and they depend on naproxen or Aleve or similar medicines for their pain control. But I want to reassure you that the weight loss for either one of these operations is going to really reduce the pain level. And also there is a prescription medicine called Celebrex, which we're happy to write a prescription for, that has the same benefits as these NSAID medicines, but does not have the same ulcer effects. So this medicine, Celebrex, is okay to use after gastric bypass and can take care of that type of headache, joint, body pain that you may be using ibuprofen, ibuprofen or naproxen for at this time. Number three, dumping syndrome. Dumping syndrome is a feature of gastric bypass. It typically doesn't happen with sleeve, although we're going to get a little bit deeper into that. And dumping syndrome is expected when a gastric bypass patient takes in large volumes of sugar. Now, I'm not talking about a nibble of a piece of cookie or a little sliver of cake. I'm talking about king-size bag of M&Ms or a slab of cake or some real sugar intake or fruit juice or substantial volumes of fruit or some simple carbs, especially rice is a tremendous one. But we don't like any of these things because they make your blood sugar spike up and then crash down and they're disruptive for your metabolism. By the way, they're disruptive for your sleeve metabolism as well because even if you don't feel the dumping syndrome, which I'm going to describe, the, um, these sugar-related, carb-related foods are still spiking your sugar and crashing it down. So we're going to have the same recommendation for avoiding these types of foods regardless of which operation you choose. So, what dumping syndrome feels like, and it may be a variety of things. It may be cramping abdominal pain. It may be nausea and throwing up. It may be loose bowels and diarrhea. And very often, it's just a feeling of weakness and I got to lay down for a little while. And it's typically not dangerous, but it feels bad and people tend to avoid it. Now, gastric bypass patients, they'll hear about this, and, and there are stories on the internet about people having dumping syndrome every day, and that's terrible, and I would not want that for anyone. But in my experience, gastric bypass patients have dumping syndrome usually two times. Once is because they test it. And I guess this is just human nature. You have to find out if the dumping syndrome actually can happen in your individual case. I'll give you that. That's fine. And then one other time that gastric bypass patients may have dumping syndrome is when they're out in an uncontrolled food environment and something like barbecue sauce may have a lot of sugar in it that people don't realize. And uh, they take in some food they didn't realize had a lot of sugar and can have dumping syndrome for that. But that's usually all for most patients, just twice. And uh, most patients in the long run with the gastric bypass tell me that they appreciate the potential for dumping syndrome because it helps them stay kind of on the right track with their food plan. Moving back to health outcomes, I'm happy to say that in modern bariatric surgery, complications are pretty uncommon. And here again, there's lots of crossover between the gastric bypass and the sleeve, lots of similarities, but also some differences that we're going to go into. In bariatric surgery, there are three big complications that we pay attention to every single time we do an operation. The three big complications are number one, a leak, 
Number two, a blood clot that can form in the legs and float up to the lungs where it can block off blood flow. That's potentially life-threatening. And number three, small chance of bleeding, which happens, of course, we're given blood thinner to reduce the chance of blood clot, etc. Now, all of these complications are very, very unlikely. And especially in our practice with thousands of patients every year, uh, we're seeing these complications once every four or five years. So happy to say they're very uncommon. And the other key thing is that if any of these big three complications happen, they'll happen within the early observation period after the surgery, very often within the first day or two, and uh, mostly within the first week or 10 days. I say very often. I told you they're very rare, but if they happen, they're going to be in that early time frame. Here's the interesting thing. These complication rates are the same between the gastric bypass and the sleeve. And um, there's this instinctive idea when you look at the diagrams, the gastric bypass has more complexity, and it does. Um, and so it's surprising actually that these would be the same, these outcomes or these risk factors. Um, and so I want to expand a little bit on the sleeve. I think that a lot of what happens with sleeve perception is this diagram. And in this diagram, um, and no discredit to the artist, but the artist has left out a lot of the blood vessels that are along this edge and has left out the nearby organs, which includes the spleen and the colon and the pancreas. The colon's in there, but not close like it really is in real life. And, and has also left out the encroaching or the intrusive fat tissue that's often there. Um, even if you do your liver shrinkage diet, still the fat can get in the way and make it difficult for us to see things. And so the point is that the sleeve isn't really a small operation. And I don't want to scare you about the sleeve. We do it very regularly. We do it very low complication rates. But it really is physiologically in the same ballpark as the gastric bypass. So the big three complications are actually the same between them. We almost never see those big three complications. Um, and if so, then we'll catch it and take care of you very quickly. Now, um, each of the operations has a complication that's more or less specific to that operation. So for the gastric bypass, yep, here we go. The gastric bypass, the fact that we're altering the small intestine and moving it around gives us a small but real chance that our patients are going to have some twisting or folding or blockage of the intestine caused by scar tissue or by a special condition called an internal hernia. Now these run less than 1%, but if they do happen, then it's necessary to go back surgically to straighten these things out. And typically we get people back to normal health and um, you know normal health conditions and this is not a reoccurring problem. In rare circumstances, circumstances, this twisting or folding or internal hernia can lead to damage to the intestine and the need to resect some intestine. And that's very uncommon with the sleeve, although not impossible if a person has a ventral hernia, which we're not going to go into right now. I picked up the sleeve diagram actually because there's a separate special complication that goes with the sleeve. Okay, A minute ago, I mentioned that either operation can have a blood clot that forms in the legs that can break off and go to the lungs. And that can happen actually with any surgery. It could be a C-section. It could be a gallbladder. It could be appendix. Certainly with either one of the bariatric operations. And that risk, that blood clot risk, is the same between the operations. The sleeve has a different blood clot, where a blood clot can actually form in this area in the veins that feed the liver and the veins that feed the intestine. This is called the portal venous system. And for some reason, this is almost never seen with the gastric bypass, but it's seen in almost 1% of sleeve patients, including, unfortunately, in our practice. And um, when this complication happens, this blood clot, most often it's the kind of thing that can be treated with blood thinner extended blood thinner and some time in the hospital, uh, but on some rare occasions it can actually cause damage to the intestine uh, with the need to remove intestine and uh, lifelong changes in intestinal function or even um, threat to life. So that each of them has their own uh, different <laughs> balancing um, special complication. Now, moving away from serious things into uh, sort of less kind of less worrisome side effects. So with either one of these operations, it's possible for people to fail to make usual progress on drinking fluids. And just to be clear, when we send people home from the hospital, we typically do not plan IV fluids. And the expectation is that our patients are going to be able to drink enough, like 64 ounces a day, to maintain their own hydration. 
The vast majority of patients succeed in this. Some patients, through no fault of their own, can't keep up with the fluids because their sleeve or their gastric bypass is irritable or resistant. This can happen with either operation. It's a little more common with gastric bypass. It's certainly less than 5%, more like 2 or 3% for each of these. Um, again, slightly more common with the gastric bypass. And uh, our solution for this, if it happens, is that we actually do have the ability to arrange for the patient to receive IV fluids at home um, and vitamins with with those IV fluids until things recover and while we also check out the anatomy and make sure there's nothing that needs to be fixed physically or surgically. Um, speaking of return to surgery, there's also, we, th we think of return to surgery as a category unto itself. Um, this too runs significantly less than 5%. This is something that can happen with either operation. Um, I mentioned that bowel obstruction thing. Um, I did mention the bleeding thing, although that's rare. Uh, we might need to do a scope to look at the sleeve or to look at the gastric bypass that can happen with either one. Um, these repeat procedures which are not planned typically will show up within the first month as we help people get back on track and then they do well. Um, these unplanned additional procedures run a little bit more common with the gastric bypass over the sleeve, again being very uncommon in both. And so the last significant complication that I think we need to talk about is a later complication that I mentioned earlier, and that's the reflux situation. I mentioned that that's mostly with the sleeve, and uh, that's a different situation where we may have to go back and reoperate. You know, the sleeve's not reversible, but if a sleeve patient, um, you know, is, has reflux, is treated with meds, um, and if the meds are not sufficient, which is, again, a 2 or 3% thing, um, then in a few patients, getting up close to 5% of sleeves, it can be necessary to change over to, guess what, change over to the gastric bypass because the gastric bypass treats reflux. So, on balance now, in the early time frame, I would say that the gastric bypass is a little more subject to glitchy problems that we'll work through, not the scary, dangerous problems. Um, in the long run, the sleeve is a bit more susceptible to long-term issues, especially this reflux situation um, that may or may not be serious for, for each individual patient. So again, not a right versus a wrong, but some differences between the operations. Summing up now, I'm going to give you some factors that might start you in one direction or the other for the sleeve or the gastric bypass, still recognizing that this needs to be a collaborative discussion between you and your surgeon. So first I'm going to talk about factors that for most surgeons would favor a sleeve operation. Number one, if a person is very likely to use tobacco in the long run, most of us feel that the sleeve would be a better choice. Number two, if a patient definitely needs anti-inflammatory medicines, the non-steroidal family, sleeve is probably going to be a better choice. There are a couple of factors that I've not discussed with you yet. Number three is one of those factors. So number three, if a patient has had extensive abdominal surgery in the past, you know, like a gunshot wound or a perforated appendix or a major colon resection, it might be nicer to do a sleeve because the sleeve only needs the surgeon to go into the upper abdomen and does not need, like the gastric bypass does, does not need the surgeon to work with all the small intestine. That one's not an absolute factor, but it may be a factor coming into the discussion. Number four is also something that I have not discussed before. If the patient we're discussing, if, if your situation is that you have very serious ongoing medical problems, and if it's predictable that you're going to need subsequent major medical interventions, let's say a heart bypass, or an organ transplant, or chemotherapy for cancer, well, the sleeve after it heals is very resilient to all those other body stresses and disruptions. Um, the gastric bypass is reasonably resilient, uh, but not as much as the sleeve. And so um, sometimes I will meet patients who need a heart transplant and need to lose weight for their heart transplant. Typically a sleeve I will choose for them um, and, and situations similar to that. And then uh, last of all, I think this is the least of the factors, but it's still, it still may be a factor in favor of sleeve. If you as the patient are male, um, the sleeve just kind of never misses on the weight loss with males like it does sometimes miss with female patients. Okay, so those are fa factors that many surgeons would consider useful in favor of the sleeve operation. Now, likewise, there are a few factors that would lean most surgeons towards gastric bypass over sleeve. The first and the most important of these is the presence of reflux. The way the gastric bypass takes care of reflux is that all the digestive juices, which is kind of the harsh part that causes heartburn, all the digestive juices are formed in this lower part of the stomach and the intestine, and they travel down here, and they actually usually cannot get all the way back up to the stomach or the esophagus where they cause this burning and heartburn. So the gastric bypass almost always takes care of reflux, and if that's a key factor leading into surgery, 
the gastric bypass would typically be a better choice. Related to that, something that I have not discussed before is if you have had a lap band in the past or if we're taking off a lap band and changing over to gastric bypass, the lap band causes reflux in two ways. One is that the lap band causes, actually let me get my diagram. The lap band is this belt around the upper part of the stomach and it causes reflux in two ways. One thing is that it uh, causes weaken of the, weakening of the esophagus over time. The swallowing function gets tired of fighting against this sort of tight belt and uh, it doesn't move food down as effectively. The other thing is that the nerves that cause the stomach to move forward are caught up in this area of scar tissue and inflammation and maybe even inside the band and so the stomach does not empty as well so all the acid that's here tends to just kind of sit there and be available to back up. And so in my experience, people who have had a band really ought to go over to gastric bypass. And this is interesting because many of the lap band patients really drank the Kool-Aid on this marketing that the band program had that was kind of making the gastric bypass seem scary. So in my conversations with patients, it's most often the lap band patients who say, well, okay, I know my lap band is not working anymore, but I want to go to a sleeve because the gastric bypass scares me. I just want you to reconsider that. And I definitely, um, we can change the band to a sleeve, but it doesn't work as well. I've done it a lot and uh, when if we sit down in person I can explain that. Um, there are surgeons who for reasonably good reasons will change a band to a sleeve so it's not outright wrong but it's not my preferred option. The other reason that we might want to think about gastric bypass is diabetes. Um, I mentioned that the gastric bypass is typically going to have better weight loss and better weight loss maintenance over the years so it's going to have better sustained diabetes remission. One factor I've not mentioned before um, where I like to think about a bypass a little bit more, this is kind of a soft indication, is, is I like gastric bypass in people who are younger. Because if I'm sitting down with someone who's in their 20s or 30s, I know they're going to live with this operation for 70 years, 80 100 years, I'm an optimist. Um, I know they're going to live with the operation for a long time and I know that the gastric bypass has already been around for all that time so I don't expect any tricky problems to show up at a later time, no pitfalls. And, and I like this lead very well but at the 10 year outcomes and moving into the 15 year outcomes we are still seeing that the story continues to develop and so the last chapter on sleeve outcomes is not written. So that's one issue that makes me think a little bit more about gastric bypass for younger people. Uh, the other thing is that um, the gastric bypass, like I mentioned, all the parts are still there. And whereas we do not plan to reverse the gastric bypass, we can if there's some reason that we need to get out of it at some point in the future. Um, and the sleeve, although it doesn't scare me to say it's non-reversible, it can be surgically corrected. Um, it is not something that can be returned to sort of the, the natural configuration uh, because that stomach is literally removed. Okay, so in summary and in closing, uh, these are both very good, very commonly performed operations. Uh, they are very comparable and there's lots of overlap in terms of outcomes and benefits and also the risks which are small. And I think that this is hopefully just a starter point for your information so that you can have a good conversation with your surgeon as you move forward into your bariatric operation. Last of all, I'm going to roll the video through kind of a side-by-side -side comparison that summarizes what I've been talking about in the video, sort of a side-by-side -side checklist, not pros and cons, but just differences. And um, I'm not going to narrate this. I'm not going to roll through it. I'm just going to let it roll over the next 15 or 20 seconds. If you're interested, great. Uh, if you're not interested in that, then it's all done. I hope you do great on your surgical journey.